Coffee time is about why you should raise queens. And then after coffee time, we're going to jump into a hive and look at these early warning signs that your hive is about to swarm. All right, so here's a frame of capped over brood. And you can tell that uh, these, these um, drone pupa were there because there was a little space. And in that little space, the bees built some straight comb and the queen laid some drones, unfertilized eggs there, which turn out to be drones. And I don't see any mites on that side of those drones. Hey everybody, David Burns with you again with another cool beekeeping video. Thank you for all your comments. I really appreciate that. And subscribers are awesome. We're trying to reach 50,000. We're over 41,000 right now, so uh, less than 9,000 to go by the end of the year. I think we've got this one in the bag. But please subscribe if you haven't and click on the bell so you'll be notified each time I make a new video. Uh, today we're going to have coffee time. Uh, coffee time, I'm not going to give a time stamp because coffee time is about why you should raise queens. And then after coffee time, we're going to jump into a hive and look at these early warning signs that your hive is about to swarm. These early warning signs start looking um, obvious about 30 days before your hive swarms. So uh, it, I know some of you are thinking that if I just look for queen cups or queen cells, I'll be able to know if my hive is gonna swarm. Well, by the time they make those queen uh, cells uh, that are capped over, they're gone, right? So there's earlier indications of a hive getting ready to swarm. Um, the literature, says, the scientific literature says, that a hive actually begins preparing to swarm about 30 days before they do swarm. Um, so anyway, we're going to talk, we're going to jump in a hive and look for those. We're going to talk about that. But coffee time is about the subject of why you should be raising your own queens. And uh, coffee time is a time that I'm going to start putting into my beekeeping videos so we can spend time together. Look at this. I'm having my coffee in a dad cup uh, because yesterday was Father's Day. Can you read what that says? It says, Dad, sorry for all the dumb stuff I did when I was younger. If it helps, you only know about half of it. <laughs> Aren't you glad that your parents never found out everything that you did? <laughs> Oh boy, I have six children and 11 grandchildren, so I get a lot of gifts and uh, encouragement during Father's Day, which was yesterday for me, and it was cool. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I got some gift certificates, which I love uh, at my favorite stores. Um, my, a lot of my kids give me Amazon gift cards. We live out in the country. We live 20 miles from the nearest uh, store. And so it's easy for me to buy stuff on Amazon because they bring it right here and put it in my hands. I don't have to go anywhere. And um, yeah, I like supporting small businesses. That's what we are. And I do that as much as I can. But things that I just have to drive 25 miles to a store, um, uh, especially a big box store, uh, I just assume get off Amazon. Um, but I do appreciate uh, my children really treating me great. They're, I have great, great children. I have three sons and three daughters. And five of my children are grown and married outside the home, of course, with, like I said, 11 grandchildren. And then Christian, our 12-year-old, is still living at home. And uh, we enjoy him so much. In fact, Christian got me this. I'm sure with the help of his mom, it says, K9EZE, -E, that's the call sign of my ham radio, amateur radio call sign. It's a pencil holder. It feels like it weighs five pounds. <laughs> it's cool. I chose the vanity call sign, K9EZE, -E, because I think ham radio should be easy. And so my son, my another son, got me this. Look at this. Wow. This is a world map on a nice, like, antique-looking canvas and a frame that I can hang in my radio shack and it has a time zones in it. So that's really cool that uh, they got me those things. Wow. Uh, I do enjoy ham radio. Uh, I, as a kid, 
I was always into electronics and, you know, Radio Shack was my favorite place to go. I bought diodes and capacitors, resistors. I built radios. I made little motors. My brother and I actually in our bedroom in the 60s, we actually had switches on our bed that we could flip a switch um, and it would open the curtains in our bedroom. <laughs> we wired that up and everything. It was just, my dad was an electrician, so we had a lot of stuff uh, in, at our disposal to experiment with stuff, and he taught us a lot about electricity. Um, I had an oscilloscope in my bedroom as a kid. I had, I had walls of electronic things. Uh, most kids have toys and books or whatever. I, I had electronics, so that's, that's just, <laughs> I, it was funny, it was weird. I see pictures of that now, I was like, wow. You know, a 15-year-old uh, teenager with a room full of electronics and oscilloscopes and CB radios and towers, and I, I, that was fun for me. I really enjoyed that. Um, um, I don't know what your hobbies were when you were little. Maybe you enjoyed, I, I had other hobbies. I, you know, I was a basketball player, a track runner. I enjoyed bicycle racing. I, I did a little bit of everything as a kid, but I really enjoyed electronics. You know, back when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, uh, we had to buy real expensive stereo systems that were amplifiers and turntables. I mean, I would go to the store and try to buy a better diamond tip needle for my turntable or buy a better balanced turntable to listen to vinyl albums of the Beatles. <laughs> you remember those days? I mean, wow, that was, we made that, that was beautiful music coming off that turntable uh, through the amplifier, through big speakers that made of wood. And I mean, now you can, you can buy something this small that's a stereo <laughs> and it has digital files and it sounds tons better than that thousand dollar stuff we we had to buy back in the 60s and 70s i i'm hitting home with some of you not all of you but some of you are going whoa yeah i had one and one of those stereo systems that was cool wasn't it uh before we get too off subject i want to talk to you about why you need to be raising queens i my phone rings off the hook do you have queens do you have queens and if you've noticed as a beekeeper, it doesn't take long before you realize I'm queenless. Why does my hive not have a queen? And in my past videos, you see how, I guess, fragile queens are in the hive, how they, you can kill one accidentally, or they can just die of natural causes. You being able to raise your own queens is huge. And, oh, there went my map. And it's not that hard to do either. I'm telling you, do not give up a dream or a hope or an idea of raising your own queens. You need to experiment with that. What do you got to lose? Try it. It's fun. I got into beekeeping uh, as a hobby and then it turned into a business. Uh, but at one point I just simply wanted to sell honey. And I had so many hives that I was trying to just sell honey from. Back then I didn't get any money for honey. It was a buck fifty, buck fifty a pound I think. Um, but I quickly kind of got into other aspects of beekeeping like queen rearing. And that was so rewarding for me to get into queen. I love raising, I still raise queens, but I love raising queens. I'm telling you, love it, love it, love it. It's so fun and easy to do. And if you can raise your own queens, whether it's just making, you know, five queens a year for yourself or 10 or making a hundred to sell to other people, you'll find that it really uh, gives you an edge on how to keep bees. Because if you're raising queens, then you don't have to buy a queen from someone. You don't have to pay the shipping, which is usually overnight 40 bucks just for the shipping. The queen is 40 bucks. You got 80 bucks in a queen that may die when you introduce her. Uh, you know, it's just a chance that she might die in shipping and or be injured in shipping. So if you can raise your own queens Oh my gosh, it's so huge. And I love it so much. Um, I give queen rearing classes here at our training center. But because of COVID-19, uh, that our queen rearing courses happen in the months of May and June. And we're past, we're almost out of June now. So we're past the ability to do that. Um, I'll probably do it next year if things clear up. But don't despair because I have queen rearing classes online. 
Yeah, you can click. I'll put a link down below. You can take my online beekeeping queen rearing course and learn how to raise queens. I, it's very specific. It walks you through every aspect of it. I mean, by the time you watch and take this class uh, on online, you'll be able to raise your own queen. So I want to encourage you to do that. Um, please don't think you're too old or you have shaky hands or you have bad eyesight. You obviously know I have bad eyesight. I can't even see a queen without my glasses on. So um, doesn't matter. You can compensate for any um, um, challenges that you may have on raising queens. You can steady your hand. You can buy glasses or jeweler glasses. And um, uh, actually some of the best grafters are older people, older women that have been used to um, sewing and things, they're really good grafters. Uh, so don't think your hands are too big or you don't have time for that. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hobby. It's, a, you know, whether you like fishing or flying, um, raising queens, you should try it if you're a beekeeper because I think you're going to find that it's extremely easy to do. As long as you follow the time schedule, which I talk about in my class, um, if, you, if you stay on the schedule the bees are on, wow, can you raise queens. And the neat thing, what I do, I bank queens. I bank them. I take a, a regular hive that, you know, two deep hive, uh, and I put a queen excluder between the two hive bodies, and then I put my queen bank in the top deep, uh, so the bottom is where the queen is. She can't get up to my um, other queens that are in cages. I have a frame that I made, and I show this in my in my class online course. But I've got a frame that I I put queens, virgin or mated, in in little cages in this frame. I'll have maybe 40 queens in this frame, and I'll just leave it in a hive. And uh, other bees tend to the queens. They feed them through the cages. I use California mini cages for that, and they feed those queens, whether they're virgin queens or or mated queens. I've held mated queens that were laying really good and I pulled them and put them in a cage and put them in a queen bank. I've held them for a long, weeks, weeks. And then I'll pull them out and need them again somewhere or sell them and wow, they lay so well. And so you can do stuff like that. You can have a queen on hand. It's crazy, I'm telling you. You gotta do this. Now virgin queen, you really don't wanna bank her too long. Uh, the literature, scientific literature says that if you bank them past 21 days where they can't take a mating flight, they, they will lose the urge to take a mating flight. So I don't like to bank my virgin queens much more than a week, week and a half. I want them to get out there and get mated while they're still pretty young. So that's important. Um, but that's cool stuff to do. So check that out. And as always, I'm still promoting the book that Sherry and I wrote, Backyard Beekeeping. And it's coming out it, uh, on July 7th. It's not much longer. It's going to be coming out. So I'll put a link down below for you to click on that if you want to uh, want to go ahead and pre-order that book from Amazon. That would help us out so much. We need to impress our publishers and we need to impress Amazon that you have an interest in that book because the more we impress Amazon that you're interested in the book, the book gets brought up higher and higher and higher. Boom! On, on the list. And I really want the book promoted because I want more people that are interested in beekeeping to hear about beekeeping from me <laughs> because I think there are some very good instructors and very good books out there. I'm not the only one, but there is some stuff out there that doggone it, it's wrong. <laughs> And it's not as good as it, not as complete as it should be. It doesn't give people the, the whole picture and everything. So I'm proud of the book. I, th I think what I wrote down in the book, Sherry and I did a good job helping new beekeepers. I'd, I want beekeepers to get started on the right foot. I think this book is gonna help do that. Well, I'm ready to jump into a hive. Happy Father's Day, everybody. And uh, I do love it that so many of you were interested in t-shirts and merchandise. I'll put Sherry to work on that so maybe she can find some uh, cool t-shirts to start uh, getting some designs worked up and we'll start ordering those, making those available soon. All right, uh, let's, I'm gonna suit up, start a smoker after I finish this cup of coffee. 
Well, let's get started. Oh my gosh, that's good. That That's good. All right, so we had uh, several people that commented uh, to me about this hive that we did a quick inspection on yesterday or the other day and several people were asking about the possibility of how do you uh, do a quick inspection like that and yet ensure that it's not going to swarm on you and that's a good question so if you want to check for swarming that is not going to be a real fast inspection to really do a thorough job to see if your hive is going to swarm it will take a thorough inspection and that's what we're going to do today and i'll show you how to look to see if your hive is going to swarm these are the wet supers that we put on a few days ago and we'll take a look to see how they're doing um, looks like these bees are really adding a lot of wax up on top i can tell that they've already repaired uh, these frames that i gave them and there's not a ton of bees up here yet but they're working to make these look good. Um, I'm going to do something kind of fast. I don't think the queen has made her way up here yet. And if she hasn't, then what I can do is take these two supers off and then just take a quick look to see if the queen is down in the two deeps below and if I see any um, queen cells. But... To make sure, let's at least pull one of these out. This particular um, super has a spacer bar in there keeping each of these frames at uh, a space that's wider than normal. And it provides a nine spacing, a nine frame spacing. And that way you can get more of your uh, honey super frames wider and it makes it a lot easier when you're extracting to cut them when they're wider if they draw them out wider all right so i'm just going to pull this one up to see if i see any eggs or larvae and because she's up in our honey super we're going to have to move her down i'm not going to mark her um, i just don't care to really mark her um, but I'm just going to pick her up and move her back down into the lower deep. And I'll show you how I'll do that. But uh, for right now we know where she's at. So this will afford us the opportunity not to cause any injury to her. I'm just going to set this frame in the shade outside of the hive. It doesn't have any uh, pu uh, pupa on it. And so I'm just going to set it outside the hive. And then um, that way I know always know where my queen is. I don't have to worry about killing her as I continue to work this hive and check it for swarm tendencies. Since we know where our queen is, uh, she's parked over there on a frame by herself. Right over here walking around. I don't have to worry about her. So I, I want to see if this particular hive may be getting ready to swarm or have any tendencies to uh, swarm within the next 30 days. So what I'm going to do is just open her up and take a look. So we're going to get rid of this super here. I like to separate my boxes and then I like to smoke between the boxes. Uh, some of you ask, how do you avoid getting stung? If I did that to my hive, they would kill me. I don't know, is it because I'm smoking like this between boxes? That smokes the top box and the bottom box at the same time. And then I want, I always work in slow motion like this. No fast movements. Let them get used to the sunlight. I'm also aware to keep my smoker going. And I'm also aware that I can't spend all day in the hive. I can't leave this open for, you know, 35, 40 minutes. I need to keep working. That's about how much I smoke it. I'll smoke the entrance again. All right. And then now what I want to do is uh, just take a look at these frames. It looks like they're, this hive really has a lot of propolis. It's insane how glued together it is it's very challenging to get this apart i think of all the hives i've ever worked this has got to be the one that has 
had the most propolis on every frame, every little connection point. It's insane. And it makes it harder to work because it gets on my fingers and I have trouble pulling a frame up like this because it's just so sticky. All right. I'm wanting to give myself some space. Uh, there's some bees uh, putting nectar on frames like that. And remember, we already took our queen out, so we don't have to give her another thought. Now, I just want to see uh, what I'm looking for is, do they have enough space to expand so that they don't swarm because they're congested? Or um, are they getting ready to do a reproductive swarm, meaning that a hive just wants to make another hive? Another colony, I should say. And so, is that what's going on? We want to look for queen cells or queen cups. Wow, that's glued down so tight. All right, trying to break everything loose. Good frame of nectar. I do see a queen cup down low. There's nothing in it. I opened it up. Let's look at, let's just, so what I'm doing is going through and just looking for any signs of queen cups, queen uh, cells, but I'm also looking for uh, what they're doing. You know, like how, how much brood do they have? How much honey is stored down here? Are they running out of space? I'm looking for that. All right, so immediately I feel good about things because they're not really running out of space. There's some drone brood. There's some brood. They're putting honey in the middle where the queen has laid some brood. And the same, this is brood, honey, pollen, you know, a little bit of everything. So right now, it's telling me that they are not going to swarm. Because they're just packing away the normal things on these frames in a normal manner. They're not uh, congested as I see it just yet. A decent brood pattern again. And now we have a chance to look at some of the bottom area. And some of you might see queen cups down there if you look. You might also notice some brood on the bottom of these frames. That's normal. I'm going to open up that little queen cup and see what's in it. Right about here. Nothing. Here's another one. Now if you look onto this, this is your classic uh, queen cup. Now don't panic. These are often down here like this, just on standby. These are not queen cells. These are drone cells. Here's a queen cup. That would be a queen cup. Um, if we're able to look inside there or even tear it open a little bit to see if there's anything in it, it's bone dry. And, and the reason I'm tearing it open, because I can tell that these aren't, uh, they're not any larger than they normally are just sitting there. Another thing I want to show you, if you look at this section here, let me get it in the camera just for you. Uh, sometimes you see this on the bottom of a frame, and many people have asked me about, that's a queen cell, that's a queen cell, is that a queen? Is that a queen cell right here? No. You know what all these are? It's a drone. These are all drones. That's a drone cell. It's, it's stray comb, and they've put drone um, pupa, it's pupating drones in there now, some larvae. So not to worry about that, okay? Uh, this is a nice frame of a little brood in the middle, mostly nectar. These are all drone cells at the bottom. Nothing to worry about here. Drones, that's a drone cell there that's not capped over all the way. Nectar in the middle. Let's look at the next next frame. 
All right, so here's a frame of capped over brood. As you can see, that looks really good. Remember, we took our queen out and we've got her set aside. This is a frame of capped over brood, looks really good, and so on. All right, I think we're ready to take a look at the bottom deep now. Let's look at all the all of the frames. Now, you don't have to look at every single frame, but you can get an idea. So I want to know what's going on in the bottom deep. And I also want to drop my queen way down there as well. Because I can get her to lay uh, lower in the hive while the other bees can start putting some nectar up in my top supers and turning into honey. All right, there's my technique of opening that box up and smoking between the two boxes. Don't leave your hive tool there. It'll fall out when you lift it up and you won't be able to find it when you need it. That's a lot heavier. Very good. All right, you see the white stuff there? Drone larvae or pupa. Uh, you can look at them if you want to look and see. If there's any mites on them and you can tell that uh, these these um, drone pupa were there because there was a little space and in that little space the bees built some stray comb and the queen laid some drone unfertilized eggs there which turn out to be drones and I don't see any mites on that side of those drones just a good little thing to look at what do you do with that? Scrape it off, put it in a little container, throw it away somewhere, don't throw it in the yard. Okay, now how many of these frames should I look at? Well, who knows? Let's start by looking at uh, some of them and then we'll decide how many we want, we want to look at. I suspect we're going to find nectar and pollen. I, I will be surprised if we find uh, brood, especially like eggs, because the queen was so high up in the hive. Uh, she hasn't been down here for a while, I don't think, right? But we can always be surprised. It'd be a good learning experience. How old is brood when the queen is up in the top uh, super? Pretty heavy. So here's a nice frame of capped over honey on both sides. We'll set it outside of the hive temporarily. Remember we parked our queen safely on another frame outside the hive. Otherwise I wouldn't want to lean every little frame against the hive that the queen could possibly crawl off of. But since my queen is safely tucked away, I don't have to worry about that. I hear a drone flying around my head. And I'm not scared about all the noise he's making. This is just, yeah, I said it was going to be nectar and pollen. A total, just a total frame of pollen. Look at that. It's insane. And it may be some bee bread, but mostly pollen. All right. Not much room to lay. Uh, right now, in assessing swarm potential... Of this colony, I'm going to say the risk factor of this hive swarming is good. <laughs> because uh, I've not seen a lot of empty frames. And so sometimes they can be so full that they might swarm. And I've just said that, but here's a frame where a queen could lay some more eggs when I move her down here. Not totally filled up. I just need to see some open frames. Brood that's capped over, no eggs or larvae. Brood that's at least eight days old and a lot of pollen again. Interesting place to put pollen for those of you in the, in the north like I am. When bees overwinter, they need the pollen, the protein of pollen. And we're finding a majority of the pollen so far is really low in the hive. In the winter time, when bees actually uh, overwinter, they begin to move upward, and they would move away from that pollen. That's unfortunate. You need pollen up in the top of the hive as the bees move up in the hive in the winter time because it's warm up there. 
That's why we make the winter bee kind feeding system with protein in the top of the hive all winter long. That's so nice. Same thing. Brood pollen. Packed brood. Packed full of brood. Packed full of pollen. I'm going to look at one more. And I'm going to smoke it again. Now the reason this particular uh, deep box is a little more flighty, if you want to call it that. They're not, some of you may hear them and see them moving more. It's because the majority of these bees down here, not all, but the majority are flyers, foragers, older bees. They're going in and out. That's why they're flighty. That's why they're moving so quickly. It's the dance floor. Uh, scout bees are telling bees where to go to go get the nectar. And so this is an active part of the flight deck. If this was a battleship or an aircraft carrier, this is where the bees or the, the planes are taking off and landing, getting refueled, going back out. All right, look at that. I was looking to see waggle dances, see if I see any. Oh yeah, there's a waggle dance. Let's see if I can show you that when I do the video edit. She's not a well-coordinated waggle dance, but there are some waggle dances going on. The flight deck, these are scouts coming in, telling everybody where to go to get the nectar. I'm really done looking because all I am seeing, now down here we do see some six day old larvae. So the, the queen was down here six days ago. And look how fast she traveled back up to the very top of the hive to lay up there. See the six day old larvae there? All right. Now let's move our queen in position. Let's go ahead and put all the frames back in this column, in this uh, deep box. Uh, I think some of you are like, would you scrape off the drones. David, get rid of those. All right. I don't want to kill a bee while I do it. Let's smoke those bees off. They're just trying to capitalize on the protein. There's a bee on my hand. All right, well, good. I got a special place. I'm going to set this for now. And clean it up in a minute. Ooh, all right. Uh, we have a frame of honey. I don't want to drop it back in the middle. We have reached the um, part of the inspection where we need to finish. Not that the bees are getting impatient with us. But I, I just know that you don't want to go much longer than what we've gone here. So we're going to just drop this frame in, drop our queen in, put our hive back together. And then after that, we will discuss what we saw and if we need to do something to prevent swarming. Well, here is the frame that the queen is on. She's right there. So what we want to do is pick her up and set her down into the deep. All right, good. She went down in there. That's good. All right, now our job, put the eye back together again. Okay, so well, let's just summarize what we did in the hive today. We opened up the hive to see if it was possibly going to swarm soon because it's a very full, robust hive. Um, gave them a super, another super, they have two on there now, but gave them a super about a week ago and the queen already made her way up there and started laying. <laughs> so we 
were able to pull her out, hold her aside while we did our inspection of the hive. What we were looking for is, of course, queen cups, queen cells, and also if they have room uh, for the queen to continue to lay and for the bees to continue to pack away a lot of protein, pollen, and nectar in that colony. So to me, they're borderline. They look like a hive that's running very efficiently. But, I mean, you could not get a hive to be more close to running at maximum wanting to swarm than that one. So, in other words, they are swarm potential. But because it's so late in the year and because they do have two supers on there and I didn't see any queen cells that had eggs or larvae in them, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed. I'm going to go back in 10 days and inspect again to make sure. So if I look every 7 to 10 days for queen cells that uh, may be developing queen cups with eggs or larvae, then I can uh, get in there and do something before half of them leave because they're a good honey producing colony right now. So what we're going to do is say, no, we're not going to do anything at all. Let's just keep an eye on them. They're running good. We do have our queen isolated. You probably saw in the video that I used the queen excluder down in the bottom uh, deep, or the, the two deeps. I put a queen excluder between uh, the final uh, second deep and the honey supers to keep the queen out of my supers. I'd rather have the honey than to have brood up there. Um, but everything looked pretty good. It was a good inspection. Uh, talking about swarming, um, I mentor over 200 beekeepers around the U.S. Uh, through Bee Team 6. And today I just sent out this newsletter to all my Bee Team 6 members uh, that subscribe to this. And it's about uh, swarming, queenlessness, and adding supers. Um, so it's really a good thing to consider when you think about swarming. Uh, this was uh, about explaining swarming in detail. Uh, how does swarming take place? And I explained uh, how far back the bees actually begin uh, to get ready to swarm. It's, it's a lot further back than we think. And then I answered questions like what happens back at home in the original hive? Why are some swarms queenless? Many people, after they catch a swarm, they can't find the queen anymore. And they wonder what happened why is the swarm queenless uh, why do some hives become queenless after giving off a swarm uh, why is it they don't raise their own queen and so these these are good things to think about uh, uh, swarming how soon will your uh, hive that produced a swarm how soon will they start laying eggs a lot of good material uh, that I sent out to my B team six members so if you're interested in being part of B team six I'll provide a link down below uh, we still have room for a few of you if you want to join up for that mentorship program. And as always, uh, be sure and click on the link below and you can pre-order our new book that Sherry and I wrote this winter on backyard beekeeping. And this is uh, really important that you take a look at this book. Order it if you can. It comes out July the 7th. Please subscribe. Give me a thumbs up for the video. And I look forward to being with you next time.